Hello everybody and welcome to this event, this Constitution Unit event on what Prime Minister Rishi Sunak means for the Constitution. I'm Meg Russell, Director of the Constitution Unit, and I'm going to be serving as the Chair for today's event. So on his very first day, Rishi Sunak said on the steps of Downing Street that he wanted to restore, I quote, integrity, professionalism and accountability to government. That followed a period under Boris Johnson when there'd been numerous concerns about those things, including the treatment of regulators, relationships with the judges, ethical standards in government and parliament, and the sidelining of parliament over key aspects of decision making. Of course, Sunak was briefly preceded, preceded by Liz Truss, whose mini budget suffered from lack of oversight following the sacking of the most senior Treasury civil servant and the refusal to engage with the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility which likewise showed some disregard for the standard forms of checks and balances. As an aside, we originally began approaching speakers for a seminar on what to expect from Prime Minister Liz Truss on the Constitution, but rapidly had to change those plans when she left office after just 49 days, perhaps unintentionally making the case for the importance of respecting checks and balances. Sunak now has to decide how to make his pledge a reality. He also has to decide how to deal with important legacy items from the Johnson period, including in legislative terms, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, the retained EU law revocation and reform bill and the Bill of Rights Bill. And he needs to think more broadly about the conduct of his government, for example, in terms of its relationship with the civil service parliament and the judges. So what should he do? And what in reality is he likely to do, particularly given some of the constraints placed upon him by his parliamentary party? These are the kinds of topics we want to explore today. I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of three good friends of the Constitution Unit, each of them outstanding researchers and commentators in their field. Jill Rutter is a senior research fellow at UK and a Changing Europe and a senior fellow at the Institute for Government. Dr. Ruth Fox is the director of the Hansard Society and Professor Colm O'Caneda is Professor of Constitutional and Human Rights Law here at UCL and an Associate Member of Constitution Unit staff. So the panellists will speak in that order, each just taking around five minutes for their opening remarks, and then we'll have a discussion among the panel for about 20 minutes. After that, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. If you'd like to ask the panel a question, please write it in the Q&A function of Zoom as opposed to the chat. Then Lisa James, our Q&A facilitator, will select a range of questions and by default will ask each questioner to unmute themselves and ask it directly to the panel. Alternatively, you can indicate when you submit your question that you'd prefer Lisa to ask it on your behalf and you can indicate if you, if you would prefer it to be put anonymously. This whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will become a Constitution Unit podcast after the event as well as being posted as a video on the Constitution Unit website and YouTube channel. You may want to bear that in mind when deciding whether to ask your own question. So with those formalities over, I'm delighted to open it up to the panel. Um, and we were going to start with Jill. Jill, over to you. Thank you very much, Meg. Uh, so Meg asked me to talk uh, about some of the aspects of that. She's actually gone back to where I was going to start as well, which were those key watchwords. Uh, from Rishi Sunak, because really we haven't had very much from him about the constitution. He's a man of relatively limited ministerial experience, indeed relatively limited political experience, only elected for the first time in 2015. So he said integrity, professionalism and accountability. I'm going to leave accountability to Ruth and the courts to Colm, but I'm going to focus a bit on integrity and professionalism. Um, has been said that Rishi Sunak, having said that in Downing Street, rather immediately showed that uh, his watchword of integrity could be trumped by politics with his decision to appoint to his cabinet two, or to his cabinet and attending cabinet, two ministers who both had been uh, forced to leave office over breaches of the ministerial code. So let's start off with integrity. What do we really think of this? When we talk about restoring integrity, uh, we talk about standards in public life and the damage to that that was done by Boris Johnson in office um, with, you could say, repeating lying, misleading Parliament. Privileges Committee is still investigating whether he specifically misled Parliament over Partygate, but he was quite fast and loose uh, with the facts. Very often in Parliament, uh, his 
inability to hang on to an ethics advisor uh, and his tolerance of misbehavior by his fellow MPs. And remember, Rishi Sunak, when he resigned following Sajid Javid, said he thought the British uh, public deserved serious and competent government. So are there any signs now that Rishi Sunak is serious about the integrity agenda? Well, so far, uh, notwithstanding those appointments, the only commitment we have is that he, unlike this trust who said she wouldn't need one, didn't quite get the role of the ethics advisor, I think they're assuming based on Boris Johnson's experience, they were purely there to investigate the prime minister. Of course, they're there to help the prime minister enforce standards on his colleagues. But he said we'll, he will appoint an ethics advisor, but although we're told the search is underway, it doesn't yet seem to have uh, produced anyone. We're also told that we're on the cusp of finding out who the independent investigator will be, who will look uh, at the uh, charges against Dominic Raab, but we don't yet know who that is either. But I think the interesting questions about the ethics advisor is, does Rishi Sunak do any more than that? Uh, does he give that sufficient resources? That was a promise that Boris Johnson made to Lord Geit before he went. Does he do anything to make it more independent, both in terms of publication of reports, but also initiating their own investigations without having to get the agreement of the prime minister? Uh, I don't think anyone thinks that ultimately the independent advisor should have the sort of Damocles uh, be able to end ministerial careers. But I think there's a really important thing about that relationship with the prime minister. But is he then going to go any further? Are we going to see any clampdowns on lobbying. I think there are stories now that the Gordon Brown Review of the Constitution is going to clamp down on second jobs. We've seen Owen Paterson rather ironically yesterday appealing uh, to the European Court of Human Rights over his mistreatment in Parliament over that lobbying scandal. And does he have any big ideas on this? We've had Labour propose an Integrity and Ethics Commission in Australia, the Albanese government is introducing the Anti-Corruption Commission. So does Rishi Sunak have any ideas that go beyond just simply appointing an ethics commission? All we can say there is the jury is yet out. We don't know where Rishi Sunak pl plans to go. But honestly, if he wants to make integrity a big watchword and having got off to quite a bad start, it would be really good if he did have quite a long list of ideas in this space and show that he's really interested. Some immediate challenges that he's going to face though. What does he do about Boris Johnson and potentially Liz Truss's peerage lists, those resignation honours? Uh, very interesting, both in terms of numbers and quality of the House of Lords, but also the way in which that looks as though it's going to uh, hit a further nail into trust in politics. And what does he do when he starts to get the privileges committee process really, really going? Will he uh, pay any attention to attempts that he may face to derail that? Secondly, and quickly, what do we mean by professionalism? I think it's fair to say that Rishi Sunak himself takes governing quite seriously. Reports out of government are that he's a hard worker and actually someone as well who found it relatively easy to work with the civil service, had quite good a relationship with the civil service and didn't bully, listen to their advice. But can he actually make that how his government functions? And I think the Dominic Raab is quite an interesting test case there. Does he actually indicate that he understands and values the civil service? Made some early signs on things like ditching the numbers target that Jacob Rees-Mogg wanted, but does he understand officials? A lot of Brexit, -y, Brexit supporters are very suspicious of the civil service because they think it's a sort of blobby remain thing. Can he do that? Another test of professionalism, and I think so far he's made not a bad start, uh, is can he reset relationships with the devolves? I thought it was very positive that he went to the British Irish Council and that he's chaired, uh, I think, one of the ministerial, uh, the interministerial forum. But does he have views beyond that? We've got the Supreme Court decision on Scotland today. Does he really have an approach to devolution? Does he have any ideas on that? Again, it's a blank space. Uh, so far, the main action is on the Northern Ireland Protocol and on Northern Ireland elections, where he's, uh, he's changed the truss approach by postponing those elections. But we, again, do not know where Rishi Sunak is on any of these issues. These are not questions on which he's been tested. So 
professionalism, personal, yes, but does he have any sort of wider agenda? Again, a totally blank space. And so I think that's probably my five minutes. So I'm gonna hand back to Meg and the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Jill. That was absolutely terrific. A canter around lots and lots of issues. And you're making my job as chair very easy by throwing down lots of questions, which are really interesting questions. And be warned, I may come back and ask you for the answer to some of them uh, when we've heard from the other speakers. And I may ask them uh, as well. But we're going to pass on now to uh, Ruth uh, from the Hansard Society, who um, is, I assume, going to say lots of fascinating things about Parliament. Ruth. Good afternoon, Meg. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, well, I'm not going to, in the time we've got, going to canter through all the problems of the relationship between Parliament and Government dating back through the Johnson administration. We'd be here far too long. But, I mean, a, a theme of it has been the sidelining of Parliament. Um, and that continued then with the Trust Government, which I think was a, the, the mini budget was a low point for many reasons, but it was a particular low point for Parliament when a, a statement of such uh, enormity was granted two hours of scrutiny on a Friday, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer then declined to appear before the Treasury Select Committee to answer any questions about it uh, for a considerable number of weeks. So. We could dismiss all of that, of course, as a one-off in exceptional circumstances, except it hasn't been uh, a one-off. You know, ministers have declined to appear before select committees for some, you know, 12 months or more now on a regular basis, cancelling them late in the day when they're on a, a sticky wicket. You know, number of departments, the Home Office, Department for International Trade, Justice, um, we, we saw cabinet ministers, you know, declining to appear before MPs to answer questions. Um, obviously, the last few months we've seen immense disruption to select committees because of ministerial turnover and the impact of reshuffles on the select committee corridor. So I think an interesting question will be, you know, how do things settle down for select committees under some new chairs, new members, but also, you know, will the presence of former chairs of select committees at the heart of government, particularly somebody like Jeremy Hunt, influence a different approach and a different tone to, to committees um, going forward? Another issue that's been a problem has been um, the government's approach to treaty scrutiny, to the scrutiny of trade agreements. And we've seen just in recent days, the former um, DEFRA Secretary of State, George Eustace, uh, indicating his unhappiness with the, uh, the trade agreement struck with Australia. Um, the government commits to pre-ratification debates of free trade agreements within the 40-day statutory scrutiny period, only so far as, as parliamentary business and parliamentary time allows. Um, and that has been problematic. And the question, I think, is um, learning from the situation in terms of the Australian deal. Will that be something that the, the government is, is more proactive in terms of making time available for parliamentarians to scrutinise it um, within the, the, the statutory 40 days? Um, it's entirely conceivable, I think, as we enter the sort of the final couple of years of a parliament, assuming that it's going to run the full term, entirely conceivable that we're going to be back in a situation again where they say, oh, sorry, parliamentary time's not available. We can't uh, we, we can't do this. Um, and you have a situation with another free trade agreement, perhaps the Indian one, where um, it doesn't get uh, the scrutiny and you have this fractious relationship over these issues with parliamentarians. Um, on the legislative side, um, and the big problem is the government bringing forward, I suppose, undercooked, underprepared bills, big framework bills, skeleton legislation filled with powers delegated to ministers rather than a lot of policy detail. It means the, the real operation of the bill um, is entirely at the discretion of ministers uh, following um, royal assent. Um, will we see a change in approach? I rather doubt it on the grounds that, you know, the government's committed to implementing its 2019 manifesto. Um, the bills that uh, are in train were you know, largely uh, agreed through collective cabinet uh, responsibility uh, and, and the, the internal governmental processes when Rishi Sunak was in cabinet. I think what's going to change them is if the backbenchers, if we see coalitions of backbenchers coalescing around amendments to dilute some of the, the policy provisions, but I don't think necessarily we're going to see a different approach in the terms of the preparation of new, new legislation. Um, clearly, the government is deeply divided over some key policy areas, and you can see difficulties ahead with the levelling up bill, which we've heard about, um, ministers possibly having to pull 
um, debate about certain provisions around housing and planning because of backbench uh, amendments attracting too much support and them risking losing votes. Um, we may also see, I think, some Conservative MPs waking up to the fact that um, bills that are stacked with powers, with broad discretion to, uh, to ministers, um, that doesn't really bode well if you're looking down the barrel of a lab an incoming Labour government. I think you know the, the, the risk with these powers is they can be used by incumbent ministers, but they can also be used by ministers in, in the next government. Um, two bills you alluded to, um, Meg, in your sort of early, uh, early introduction, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill and the retained EU law bill. I think these are going to be interesting in terms of, of what happens. Obviously, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, it's now in the House of Lords. Um, most constitutionally important point about that bill, of course, is that it, um, it, you know, it's not compatible with international law. So I think the question is, will the government press ahead with it? Um, it, it a lot will depend upon, obviously, the complex circumstances around what's happening in Northern Ireland. But if they push it to, you know, to the brink, I think a big question then arises for the House of Lords. Will they agree to, uh, you know, to, to support that bill, knowing that it is, it is a breach of international law? That is above and beyond normal political business. Um, and so we may see a, a constitutional standoff. And similarly, I think on the retained EU law bill, we may see, may see something similar. Um, the, the big issue around this is going to be whether the sunset by which uh, December of next year, the government have to decide whether or not to keep any and all pieces of retained EU law, and if not, it will expire. Um, it's hugely controversial. There's been a lack of support, even within government, for the imposed deadline of December 2023 on the grounds it's not manageable to review all retained EU law by then. We, don't, we know the position that Rishi Sunak's taken only in the sense that um, he got a carve out of financial services uh, and carved out the future of retained EU law into that bill. So it's not that sort of some of the Treasury issues are not covered by this retained EU law bill. And we know that Treasury ministers, at, when he was uh, the, the Chancellor, expressed real concern about the deadline. So I think it's entirely possible that the sunset deadline will change, but whether or not the broad discretion to ministers to review uh, retained EU law more broadly will be amended. I think uh, we'll have to see, and obviously a lot will depend upon the position that the House of Lords take to it um, when it when it gets there, um, probably in the new year. Great, thank you very much, Ruth. And um, I'm sure we'll come back to some of those things as well. Um, but before we open up to discussion, um, let's come to our final panelist. Uh, last but not least, um, Colm, talk to us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Um, the from a some, from a sort of legal constitutionalist perspective, um, Rishi Sunak inherits a number of uh, constitutional conundrums, dilemmas, areas of tension um, that in an ideal universe with the general election looming in, in the not too distant future, he might prefer not to deal with. But unfortunately, he is um, fortunately or unfortunately, he is to some extent stuck with them. Um, you, you, there are there are, I think, um, four particular areas um, from a constitutional law perspective that are particularly problematic. Um, the first is the issue of UK human rights law and wider issues of the relationship between the judiciary and other branches of government. Secondly, the range of specific issues arising in respect of Northern Ireland, in particular, the protocol issue that Ruth has already mentioned. Thirdly, the wider set of issues around devolution, um, most graphically highlighted by this morning's um, UK Supreme Court judgment that I just finished reading just before I came alive on this. And then finally, the set of issues relating to the UK and EU, um, as again, um, Ruth has flagged up. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the issues relating to um, human rights law and the Northern Ireland Protocol, though I'm going to say some things very briefly more generally about the other range of issues confronted by them. Um, as we know, the, the, the UK human rights law has been a constant source of political agitation and tension. It's now been 17 years since David Cameron, when he became Tory leader, initially promised to do something about the Human Rights Act. Uh, 17 years on, the Human Rights Act has remained intact um, and part of UK law. 
Um, it, it now appears that with the change in prime ministership that um, Dominic Raab's um, very much his, his, his personal project, this, this idea of a UK Bill of Rights, the second Bill of Rights, as the lawyers like to point out, to replace the Human Rights Act is now back on as a project. All the indications are that that bill, which was introduced in the Johnson Premiership, which had its second, which was introduced into Parliament, will now be proceeding. Um, though we don't know anything about the parliamentary timetable as yet. So it looks as if um, that the Bill of Rights bill, so to speak, is back on the table, having been unceremoniously shelved for the duration of the Truss Prime Ministership. Um, the Bill of Rights is the tabled Bill of Rights bill. It's probably fair to say is a, um, how would I put it politely, a challenging piece of legislation. There are various technical aspects of the bill which even if one was fully signed up to the Tory project of doing something about human rights law, there are certain specific technical aspects of the bill that make it um, less than fit for purpose. Um, there is a uh, section three of the bill, which is supposed to shape how UK judges take into account Strasbourg jurisprudence and jurisprudence from other countries in interpreting human rights standards. And um, this section three contains some truly remarkable provisions, including the introduction of a criminal burden of proof standard beyond reasonable doubt for the first time, perhaps in the whole history of UK public law as a judicial test to determine when UK courts should take into account new developments in the Strasbourg jurisprudence. I won't bore you with the technical details in this, but it's fair to say um, it's an innovative approach, which is unlikely to find favour in the House of Lords. Um, it's in, in general, bill contains numerous um, quirky features, which are uh, will be crying out for debate, contestation and reinterpretation in the Lords. And um, they're not likely to find particular favour from the legal community and a large number, a, a, an interestingly large number of former judges have been very vocal about what they see as a very, very, very defective um, piece of legislation irrespective of one, what one thinks about human rights law more generally. But we have, for the time being, a commitment to take that Bill of Rights project forward, presumably the bill in its existing state. Um, it remains to be seen what happens there. There are interesting issues about parliamentary timetable and the strength of opposition. It's fair to say this is very much seen as a personal project linked to Don McGrab. So the, um, the success of the bill may very well be very much linked to Don McGrab's personal status as a minister in, for, the, for the duration of the government. Um, then you have the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol, already mentioned by Ruth. The um, Northern Ireland Protocol is winding its way through the House of Lords. Um, it remains intensely controversial, involving, as it does, the UK legislate, legislation to put itself in clear contravention of its obligations under um, international human rights, uh, international law, I'm sorry. Um, it's very, very controversial. Um, there is a lack of enthusiasm for it in the Lords. Um, it's an interesting situation in the debates about the bill because the government is simultaneously piloting the bill through the Lords while making it clear that negotiations with the EU are ongoing. And that's, I think, having an interesting effect on parliamentary scrutiny because there's a certain degree of um, ambivalence about the bill. There's uncertainty whether it's necessary, what the final end product is going to look like, and so on. Um, all of this is linked to the suspension of devolved self-government in governance in Northern Ireland. Um, the DUP has made it clear that it won't um, enter uh, devolution arrangements in Northern Ireland without some sort of agreement on the protocol. Um, given the fact that we may very well not be having some clear agreement on the protocol, that, that puts an into a question mark over the short-term future of devolved governments in Northern Ireland. Legislation is pending to extend all the relevant timetables that are required in that circumstance. So the protocol's fate is very much bound up with the fate of devolution in Northern Ireland. So there's an entire set of constitutional conundrums in there, which um, it'll be interesting to see how the Sunak government changes, uh, how, how the Sunak government chooses to um, approach that issue. Um, we have, of course, the wider issue of devolution. We'll have to see how the political reaction to today's judgment plays out. And then, of course, we have the issue of retained EU um, law, which has already been discussed by Ruth.
Um, one, I'll make one final point and then I'll conclude. Um, there's an overarching theme, by the way, running through a lot of these different constitutional conundrums, where because the government isn't very clear as to what it, it wants um, by way of its final legal end term goal, what unifies almost all these different pieces of legislation in play linked to these different constitutional conundrums is that they all um, contain provisions giving ex government a, a, a extensive powers to regulate via statutory instruments and, and secondary legislation more generally. This is the case of the Bill of Rights Bill. This is the case of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. This is the case of the Retained EU Law Bill. And if all these pieces of legislation go through in the parliamentary timetable, big if, and they all become part of law, um, there will be a significant transfer of power to the executive um, with significant areas of law having to be shaped by secondary legislation. That will, of course, put pressure on the already overstressed uh, scrutiny mechanisms within Parliament. So there, there's sort of wider issues to bear in mind there, in addition to the specific conundrums that the Sunak government has to, has to deal with. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you all. You've set out a huge range of issues there and um, answered some questions, but also raised some questions, I think. Um, and there's a lot that we don't know, obviously, um, about Sunak and his own intentions. And he's got uh, a lot on his plate and is in a very difficult political situation, I think. I mean, it's, it's interesting that... Um, you know, notionally, the government still has a very large majority um but we have seen just how divided um this parliamentary conservative party is and i think there are there are some interesting questions about what we think he might want to do and what he might be allowed to do in several of these areas and i wonder it, it might be worth going around the panel and asking you all to reflect on that i think in in the different areas that you've identified so for example jill was talking about the privileges committee inquiry and the desire for you know more professionalism in government um ruth was talking about um retained eu law um colin was talking about um the bill of rights and the northern ireland protocol do you think there is a um a difference between what Sunak might ideally like to do and what he will be allowed to do and who is putting who is putting pressure on him is it one is it is is he subject to pressure from one set of people to do one thing he might want to do or actually is he on some of these things I think he is on some of these things pulled in different directions by different competing groups of backbenchers as well as obviously on the protocol the pressures in Northern Ireland Jill, would you like to reflect on that a bit in some of the areas you've identified? Yeah. I think in the areas I set out, generally, he can be quite a master of his own fate because I don't think there's a big sort of parliamentary agenda. He may come under degrees of pressure on the Privileges Committee. Uh, I think as, uh, as, you know, as identified, his problem there would be less with Parliament than with people behind him. And I think the, the big question for Rishi Sunak is not can he get things through Parliament so much as can he uh, can he do things and remain Prime Minister, given that the taste that the Conservative Party seems to become almost addicted to for uh, regicide or its female equivalent. So I think that's his that's one of his big problems. I think one of the interesting things will be you know where you know for example something I didn't mention possibly should have done public appointments. It's quite interesting. When he was chancellor, notwithstanding the fact that number 10 interfered quite a lot, the Treasury made really conventional public appointments of people who looked pretty well qualified and could possibly have equally been appointed by a Labour chancellor. So, uh, and I think it's really interesting. We saw under Boris Johnson, Liz Trust really didn't have enough time to give us any sort of revealed preference on her approach to public appointments. Uh, but you can see from her sideline of institutions that uh, if she thought they were inconvenient, she would just bypass and denigrate. Um, that there was a lot of interference in the public appointments process, points got delayed a long time, partly because number 10 was so disastrous at decision making. But we also saw things like the arguments over Ofcom, the BBC, various, various places where uh, there were clearly quite sort of, you know, 
partisan ish appointments. And I think one of the interesting tests, particularly for the sort of professionalism agenda, some of the points we've been making about relationships with regulators, is does Rishi Sunak, in a sense, favor the sort of technocrat candidates for some of these things? And does he actually also make public appointments efficiently? Because that's certainly not been a hallmark of any governments because it's had to go such, through such a convoluted process of going into number 10 for a degree of sort of political, political vetting. So I think on my areas, he's got quite a free reign with one exception. And that's the exception of who's in his cabinet. Uh, because clearly for someone who wanted to major on integrity, reappointing a minister who had been uh, resigned the week before over a breach of the ministerial code, got his premiership off to a very poor start because there was clearly a sort of you say one thing and you do the other and that was you know appeared to be a bargain done i think labor refers to it as a grubby bargain we don't know quite the terms of trade but it seems to be to keep that suella braverman wing of the party on side and i think that's the really interesting thing as where's the real politique end up in some of the people that he he keeps his cabinet. Gavin Williamson, I think he probably wanted for different reasons, but again, a high integrity, highly professional operation probably wouldn't have had Gavin Williamson sitting at the cabinet table. Thank you, Ruth. On particularly on retained EU law, it feels like there are some quite different tensions there. Because on the one hand, you've got perhaps people who are you know, the original Brexiteers who are very keen to see this symbolically, if nothing else, going through with the sort of maximum ability for the government to sweep away these regulations. But actually, the institution which is going to lose from that, aside from the effect of, you know, when you, the, the specifics in terms of environmental regulation and so on, which people out there in the country are going to care about, the people who are going to be being potentially cut out of this equation, this decision making, are parliamentarians, are MPs. So is he subject to cross pressure there for, you know, parliamentarians actually wanting better processes, but there being a certain set of parliamentarians who perhaps for symbolic reasons want him to go in the other direction? How do you think those dynamics work? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in terms of legislation, he's not master of his own fate in the way that uh, Jill's set out in relation to her areas. I mean, he is he is going to be pulled in multiple directions. And on retained EU law, you've got on the one hand, this is the bill that is the brainchild of Jacob Rees-Mogg. And you've got sort of the arch Brexiteers uh, taking a fairly dogmatic approach. They want uh, to get this through as quickly as possible. Um, you know, to talk about sweeping uh, some of this uh, re legislation away. And on the other hand, you've got, I think, realists both on the backbenches and within cabinet who recognise the enormity of the exercise of reviewing retained EU law, thousands and thousands of pieces of retained EU law, of knowing whether you've captured it all. I mean, one of the problems with potential problems with this bill, if it goes forward in, in this way, is the inadvertent omission. If they if they don't find a piece of retained EU law, it will expire and they don't automatically save it uh, before the sunset next next year. It will fall away. It will expire. And, you know, there are administrative concerns about what the consequences of that might be. You know, for example, a piece of retained EU law that uh, I don't know, imposed a statutory charge or fee. Um, the, the, the legal underpinnings, the foundation for that would fall away. Um, and the government doesn't want to find itself in the position of carrying on charging those fees illegally. Um, so there's there's all sorts of, of potential problems in that direction. Um, I mean, it is a real, it was described to me by a, a former Conservative minister as a barnacle on the boat that the government can do without, because it's, you know, on the one hand, it, it, it exposes the tensions within cabinet and within the, the, the wider Conservative Party. Um, but the way that they structured the bill, um, and because there's no real policy detail, we don't know what they intend to do with any of these pieces of retained EU law. It's all powers and, and not policy. There's, there's no detail in it. And we don't know what the review process is, uh, other than in the very broadest terms. Um, it's, it's almost an open invitation to all these campaign groups in all across all these sectors um, to be to be raising concerns and to be lobbying MPs and, and ministers and so on, and they haven't got the bandwidth. 
And somebody um, made the point to me earlier that perhaps Sunak as a former chancellor will be very concerned, particularly concerned about the legal uncertainty for businesses created by this situation. And therefore, maybe he's actually going to want to change some of the provisions of the bill, perhaps allow the sunset provision to be removed, those kinds of things. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, as I, as I alluded to in my earlier remarks, I mean, I think the prospect of the sunset date changing is, 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 is considerable, um, precisely because when he was Chancellor, they were expressing, as part of the interdepartmental right round process on the bill over the summer, they were expressing concerns in the Treasury about that. Um, and, you know, at that point, the deadline, the sunset deadline was 2026. And between uh, that period and the bill being brought forward by Jacob Rees-Mogg, presented to Parliament for first reading, it was reduced to 2023, which is a much, much tighter timescale. Um, you've got former DEFRA ministers on the back benches, for example, former transport ministers who are very exercised about the, 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 the concerns for their, those departments, which have got the biggest sway of retained EU law, about basically the, the problem of trying to review all of this, this regulation, decide what to do with it, and that having an impact on their ability to do anything else in the department. So a real concern about administrative um, bandwidth and capacity within, within Whitehall. So I think all these competing pressures are gonna come into play and you probably will see some, uh, some amendments in terms of the timescales. I can see that Jill is wanting um, yeah. to come in and I, I, would, I will I would... come to you, Jill, and then I'll come to Colm. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I keep forgetting to say is, do please send in your questions for, from the audience in the Q&A function. There's some nice ones coming in, um, but now is the time to start getting them in because we'll turn to them shortly and uh, we want to have a good range of questions. So, Jill. I just to add that on retained EU law, the Chancellor last week, Jeremy Hunt, did sort of highlight five areas for regulatory reform. And actually, that was a much more sensible approach to you know, regulatory reform is to select areas where you can properly propose changes like financial services or whatever that you think will be a net benefit to the UK rather than tie up huge amounts of bureaucratic, bureaucratic time and effort on the back catalogue of EU regulations. The problem, of course, is if you just delay the sunset, you prolong the uncertainty. The one thing going for a 2023 sunset is, you know, you could be out the other side of the process by then. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see whether whether at some point Hunt and Sunak feel they have the authority to just let the retained EU law bill suddenly sort of disappear and not go anywhere, which I think is probably what they may very well be hoping to do. So other things, Colin, that they, some people might be hoping will just disappear are the Bill of Rights Bill and the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, but he's cross pressured on those things as well, isn't he? The same sort of Brexiteer pressures on the Northern Ireland Protocol with actually the ERG somewhat sort of sabre rattling and saying they could even bring the government down if he reneges on those things. But then the EU pressures in the other direction and similarly Bill of Rights, you've got Robert Buckland, former Lord Chancellor saying, you know, that he, he doesn't he doesn't want that to proceed, but other people on the competing side. How, how does it look to you sort of politically? Yes, politically, I think it's quite interesting. Um, it's fair to say from on, on the Bill of Rights issue, there is very, very clear opposition, both um, uh, outside the Tory party and inside the Tory party. There's a considerable degree of scepticism. Um, the sidelining of the bill on the very first day of the Trust Premiership, the lack of any particular backlash against that sidelining decision illustrates the fact that there's not vast enthusiasm here. Um, for the Bill of Rights proposal, and it is very much seen as a on the ground personal project, um, and therefore its 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 fate seems to be quite bound up with um, with Rab's particular profile within the party and how things play out for him in his ministerial career over the next year or so. Um, so it's fair to say that the 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 the, the Bill of Rights is um, is afflicted to some extent, both by a broad range of external opposition plus. A, a fair degree of internal scepticism. Um, he all, uh, th there's also, of course, the issue of parliamentary timetable. Um, the, 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 the Bill of Rights issue is something where, of course, falls right within the House of Lords historic role as sort of protector of constitutional liberties. Um, the Bill of Rights, uh, technically speaking, explicitly um, repeals and reenacts the human rights law into effect. 
Uh, the Conservative Party manifesto in 2019 talked about updating the Human Rights Act as opposed to repealing it and replacing it, which is what the Bill of Rights does. So there's a rather interesting argument that the Salisbury Convention, for all its uncertainty, doesn't necessarily apply to the Bill of Rights Bill. Um, so there's a range of issues there. Um, the, uh, which, which it, I think inevitably will um, make for a narrow political path for him on that on that particular front. Um, Northern Ireland Protocol, big issues here as well. Um, so much of the fate of that may very well be bound up with the ongoing negotiations with the EU. Um, there's been some nice mood music about how those negotiations are going. Whether that amounts to substance is another matter. Um, the, uh, but the political sit but but its link to the political situation in Northern Ireland remains very 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 difficult because it's worthwhile bearing in mind that any concessions to the DUP over the protocol issue, if they go far enough, will immediately start triggering a political reaction from the other side, from the majority of Northern Ireland political parties and MLAs who are actually quite happy with the protocol and were elected recently in, in, in elections and manifesto commitments that were actually, broadly speaking, pro-protocol. Um, so there's a real messy range of issues there. And of course, the Irish government may have something to say about that and other actors. So it's um, on both the Bill of Rights front and the Northern Ireland Protocol front. Um, it, it's, they're, 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 they're both projects that are inherently out on a limb, so to speak. Um, and, 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 and there's a lot you could see that could potentially go wrong with them, from the fate of an individual minister in Don, in, in, when it comes to Don McGrath and the Bill of Rights, to um, you know, the, 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 the wider question about UK-EU relations. Um, so you know, it's, it's a sort of hazardous path there, with, of course, the parliamentary timetable and the time frame to the next general election. Next. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to the audience questions in a minute. So you've still got a chance to send some in. Uh, but let me just do one further quick round if if we can. And I have two thoughts here. One is that it seems to me we've talked quite we've talked about quite sort of hard decision making in terms of legislation, etc. But one thing that has struck me with Sunak is he does appear to be, I, I assume deliberately projecting a much more sort of emollient and much more kind of collegiate approach in terms of relationships with others. We saw this with the devolveds where he was very keen to talk to uh, the first ministers quickly, unlike Liz Truss and perhaps to an extent unlike Boris Johnson to sort of rebuild relationships. We've seen the pictures with Macron, those, those pictures of him at the G20, trying to rebuild the international reputation, uh, for perhaps, perhaps sort of for, in, for integrity and good democracy, et cetera. Um, so I wonder whether there are things that you think he can achieve through relationships and just a different style of government in your different areas. And then, Jill, I cannot help but come back to you, and Ruth might want to comment on this as well, on your question about what he can do about the resignation honours, uh, because this is a bit of a test. Uh, he's been, the, the gauntlet has been thrown down particularly by Angela Rayner, but lots of other people saying that he simply ought to stand in the way of resignation honours from Johnson and Truss. So this could be a bit of a test for him. Are there things that you think he can do? So let's go around again, um, Jill, Jill and then maybe Colm and Ruth. Well, I think on the resignation honours, I might throw that back to you, Meg, as the head of the Constitution Unit, to ask, can he actually stop that? I mean, I think, you know, probably with every bone of the body, of his body, he would like to stop them. Because actually, I think Rishi Sunak is, sees himself as quite a serious person. He didn't have to be a politician. He had quite a successful business career. And I actually thought that, you know, his quite pained resignation in the summer about, you know, this really isn't a government I can stay part of anymore. His lines about serious incompetent and things like that. Really, we're someone who is thinking, what on earth have I got myself into? And I do think he sees himself as someone who does, does sort of take issues seriously. You don't see that so much in the knockabout at Prime Minister's questions, but he, I think he does take his job quite seriously and doesn't want to be the Prime Minister of a country that you know we saw the great phrase from Paul Krugman about the reaction to the trust quarting mini budget he doesn't want to preside over a country that's suffering from a moron risk premium or 
uh, a bad governance premium, if you like, because it's it's not to be trusted. And one of the fascinating paradoxes of what I call the trust quartang hiatus is that it has made these independent institutions hugely more authoritative than they were. I mean, this is a government uh, which I think, yeah, I think almost gone too far, which has to sort of be quite deferential towards the Bank of England and whose fate lies in the hands of Richard Hughes, who, for whom, you know, three months ago, everybody would be saying, who on earth is that? I mean, you know, Richard is now, you know, ubiquitous but you know former director in the treasury is that really the person we want to hand the fate of governments to i think it's quite a sort of interestingly strange position that the government has got itself into by dint of seeing that there is a very very significant real world price for trashing institutions and checks and balances i think a really interesting question is and this goes to the sort of paper that the institute for government put out uh two weeks ago or so on constitutional guardians does Rishi Sunak actually see that not he doesn't just you know come to trash them. He actually should use some of his bandwidth, maybe fourth term legislation, to strengthen some of the bodies and to do some of the legislation. If you like to preempt the Angela Rayner agenda, would he even think about doing this in a cross party way and say actually you know we all have to restore trust in our institutions. It's good for none of us that people think that you know people who go into politics for quite noble reason we disagree on what we want to do but we're all here for the right reasons and we don't like to be reviled to be you know below estate agents and those veracity indices that Ipsos Mori always publish and we'd like to really do something about that and I think it's really interesting about whether he has a sort of imagination or interest to try to get ahead of this and actually say, well, just as I want to have restored our reputation for management of the economy, I also want to develop a quite a big agenda about, you know, not just patching up the bits that Boris Johnson destroyed, um, but also going much further uh, in the way that John Major reacted to his scandals by the Nolan Committee and things like that. And will his MPs let him do that if, say, he wants to clamp down on second jobs or outside sources of income? Some, yeah, we know that some of the former prime ministers have very substantial sources of outside income now, so it may not go down too well. Might remove a potential challenger though from the list, so it could be could have a big co-benefit there. That is a very, very interesting point, I think, about the cross-party working, because there's something reminiscent now, the situation that Sunak is in of where Theresa May was, of course, with a in a much weaker position in a minority government, but of sort of having opponents on both sides of her own party. And her possible way out of that was to go across the aisle. Uh, and you can defang the opposition by doing that potentially as well. So, But you've got to be bold. You've got to be brave to do it. And you've maybe got to sideline some of your own party in the process. So that, that's really interesting. Colm, I'm, I'm aware we, we, we need to keep an eye on time and get to the audience. But these, this, this question about sort of relationships and style and whether you can achieve things just by working with people differently at the evolved level and perhaps internationally. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Jill. I, I think Rishi Sunak is very clearly trying to uh, do things in a different way. Him, he, him turning up the British Irish Council, for example, was a very significant gesture um, that was appreciated in Dublin in an area that had become very fraught. The mood music around negotiations, the EU is very different from how it was. Um, so I certainly think he has an aspiration to do things differently. Um, the problem is that some of these continuing co naughty constitutional conundrums he's dealing with don't lend themselves to very, very easy resolution. The, uh, the Bill of Rights project remains intensely controversial and um, deeply disliked in various circles, highly divisive. The, um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, well, it involves Northern Ireland, which means by definition, there aren't any clear and obvious, easy consensual positions to be identified and reached there. So I think we'll see an interesting clash between his aspirations in terms of how he wants to govern and the naughty and messy reality of some of the pl political projects he has continued to sign up to. Ruth, any thoughts on this? And you might want to come back to the honours question, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm with Jill, I'll kick it back to you. I mean, anything I, I, I've been able to think about is um, on that, he could basically tell the four MPs, look, you'll, you'll get your honours in due course, but not now. Um, and they'll be on the list of uh, his list when he when he leaves office. 
Um, and that's a sort of um, rather um, unpleasant uh, behind the scenes solution, but that, that may be a way forward because um, he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't in, in certain quarters. Um, I mean, the whole, he clearly wants to take a more collegiate approach. I mean, he's clearly, with the Devolves, for example, um, you know, showing, um, a, try, trying to show a different tone and different attitude to his two immediate predecessors. But I mean, as Coleman said, I mean, ultimately, the test is is not the gesture of politics, it's, it's the actual action on the ground. And if he's, if he's pursuing bills and pursuing regulations, that uh, you know, Westminster is legislating in areas of devolved competence. Um, then it doesn't matter what the you know the the, the mood music is um, at some of these meetings. Ultimately, you are heading in a difficult direction in terms of constitutional relationship with the, the with the devolved administrations um, and clashes of, over policy and who is making law when uh, and and how uh, in respect of in respect of areas of devolved competence. I think for him, what yeah, what does he want his legacy to be? Has he thought sufficiently about that? Is that going to be something that he's thinking about over the, the next few months? And in terms of, of legislation, you know, he could face death by a thousand cuts because backbenchers have got a taste for rebellion. If backbenchers are not planning to continue at the next general election, they're stepping down, they've nothing to lose. Um, his his ability to to sort of almost sanction them is 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 less than it than it would be at the start of a parliament. Um, you know, at what point is he going to draw the line? What where is where is the the line in the sand where he's 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 not going to give ground to these coalitions of backbench opposition? And I think that's going to be the interesting test. Where does he decide? that uh, you know, he, he's a step too far and he's gonna have to stand up to some of these uh, backbenchers in order to, to get the legislation through and to, to, to define his position on some of these big issues rather than being knocked about by the pressures. Yeah, very true, which of course is, is, is one of the key things that Theresa May never felt that she could do uh, because of her minority government situation. She couldn't, for example, be threatening to strip people of the whip and so on. Uh, she, she was frightened of sidelining those, those ERG elements in particular, whereas maybe he has the numbers to do that if he wants to be bold. That's very interesting. Let's go over to Lisa. I can see we've got some very interesting questions that have come in. Hopefully we'll fit in a couple of rounds. Um, would you like to uh, tell us who we should be um, answering questions from? Yes, uh, thank you. We've had some really good questions. We're going to start um, by taking three questions. The first from Tom Brake, um, the second from Catherine, uh, and the third from Jack Newman. Okay, and we're going to call people onto the screen. I think, did Jack Newman have a couple of questions? Is there a particular one that you... Uh, he did. I would suggest we uh, go with the second of his questions, which picks up some of the things that the panel have touched on already and uh, might give us a chance to expand on some of those a little bit more. OK. Uh, well, I can see we have Jack on the screen. So why don't we start with Jack? But we'll hopefully have uh, Tom and Catherine also able to ask their questions in a moment. Jack. Hi, thanks. All. Yeah, really interesting conversation so far. I'll kind of mush my questions together, if that's OK. And the first <laughs> one was to um, think about Rishi Sunak as in terms of his electoral strategy, like what what constitutional issues and what responses to constitutional problems are going to help him in an election. I imagine a lot of this is about signalling competence and integrity. But then that electoral approach, what kind of consequences is that going to have for the, the constitutional guardians? Is that going to be have continual erosion as we saw under Johnson and Truss or do you think the kind of pressure from the public is likely to to lead to a bolstering and strengthening of those constitutional guardians thank you great thank you I think that question about the electoral strategy is really interesting and you get a bonus point on the panel if you mention the constitution in its recent public opinion work on uh, what the public want on these issues Tom I'll ask your question thank you uh, clearly uh there's been a lot of discussion about integrity, professionalism and accountability, but uh, we know from past experience that a new prime minister, whatever Rishi Sunak does, could do something completely different. Uh, so my question would be, what can we do that uh, would entrench this, uh, 
clearly unlock democracy, we campaign for a written constitution. That might be one of ways of doing it, but that's clearly not going to happen in the next couple of years. So what could realistically be done to try to ensure that any decisions that Rishi Sunak makes around more integrity, professionalism and accountability are there for the long term and not simply undone by another prime minister? Thank you. Very good question. And finally, Catherine. Yes, hi. Um, I guess reflecting on the conversation that's been had, I was interested in whether the panel think there's actually any scope for some of these proposed pieces of very controversial legislation to be dropped altogether, um, particularly the Bill of Rights Bill, but also reflecting on some of the other points, just uh, wondered if there's a chance for them to, to go altogether. Yes, terrific. Thank you very much. Let's come back to the panel and let's try and keep answers fairly short so that we can get another another round in. We're due to finish at quarter past. Um, should we start with Ruth this time? Um, I'll take it in reverse order. Um, you don't have to answer all of them either, of course. So okay. cherry pick if you wish, and then uh, Jill will get the difficult bits, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, scope for some of the legislation to be dropped altogether. Um, I mean, I suppose the Northern, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill may be, possibly, depending upon how events turn out. And that's, that's dependent upon the direction of negotiations with the EU and outcome of the assembly elections and so on. I don't think the retained EU law bill will be dropped, but I think it could be, as I said, you know, re revised considerably. Um, and I'll leave the human rights bill to, to come, but I think um, a lot of it's going to come down to pressure of parliamentary time and how long this, this, these bills get, uh, get stuck in the House of Lords. I mean, the government will be able to, if it wants to, rather than dropping them, it can just sort of string things out a bit in terms of its parliamentary management. And oops, we get to the end of the session and sorry, there's not enough time to, to get everything through. So, so that there may be some, some um, sort of routes through, through there. In terms of the electoral strategy and, and responses to constitutional problems, um, I, I obviously have read all the constitution units uh, work on this and its research, but I, I come back to my former life as somebody who ran election campaigns. Uh, over nearly a decade and um, I'm afraid I'm just not convinced that there's an awful lot of electoral advantage to running on a constitutional uh, you know, a constitutional platform. Um, I think these things are important to do in and of themselves. I think you can get benefits for them but I don't really see it as part of a major electoral strategy. Um, you know ultimately I'm afraid it is the economy that's gonna gonna dictate things. Um, so I, you know, he may want to run on constitutional platform for legacy purposes, um, and that that may be a route through. But I don't think that those they're, they're going to see um, electoral advantage uh, to any great extent um, that that leads them to to pursue these kinds of kinds of reforms. Thank you. Can I come to Colm next? Um, Ruth very explicitly left you the Bill of Rights Bill and whether it can be dropped, but you might also want perhaps to comment on entrenchment, Tom's question. Yes, look, I mean, the thing is, on all of these issues, there is a consensual middle path waiting there. Um, and, and, and there are off ramps in, 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 on, on, on all of these issues of constitutional controversy. So it'd be interesting to see whether those off ramps are taken. And um, for the last couple of years in the Conservative government, um, there's been a sort of interesting dichotomy. There's been the frankly antagonistic attitude taken towards um, uh, the sort of post Blair framework of constitutional norms that many ministers within the Johnson government took. But there's also been the approach that, for example, Robert Butland took as, as, as Lord Chancellor Minister for Justice which was to use mechanisms like the independent review into judicial into administrative law and to and the established independent review into the human rights act to try and have some sort of expert consensus position put together now um the that approach um is 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 one way of going down things when it's come to the specific issue of the bill of rights um Dominic Raab's approach just completely flies in the face of the Buckland approach and indeed the conclusions of the Independent Human Rights Act review, and which have effectively been sidelined. There's a year's work there, which produced a hugely impressive document, the, the report of the Independent Human Rights Act review, um, which, which is actually, I think, one of the best things that's been produced in, in, in constitutional reviews in this country for, for some considerable time period, which has just comprehensively been ignored. 
court. Now, um, its conclusions are inevitably going to be put back into the picture in debates in the House of Lords. Um, if, 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 if there's a off ramp there on the divisiveness of the Bill of Rights proposal, that's where the off ramp is. So it'll be interesting to see do, does Rishi Sunak and does his government choose to take that off ramp? perhaps try and find a compromise proposal towards reform of the Human Rights Act, a compromise proposal on the Bill of Rights by invoking the review and taking its, its, its proposals and its reform proposals into account, or do they go full speed ahead for the confrontation on that specific issue? That, I think, will be a rather interesting test of how, the, of, of how Rishi Sunak sees constitutional governance. Wonderful, thank you. And Jill, you'll have thoughts as well, probably on the the entrenchment of some of this integrity stuff, perhaps in response to Tom Brake, um, and anything else. So, uh, so merging that with with Jack's point, um, of course, the first answer is that Rishi Sunak, along with everybody, every other leading politician, needs to uh, look at the outcomes of the Institute for Government Bennett Institute's constitutional review being published, I think, next summer that Jack is working on. So and you need to look at that. That will have loads of great ideas on how to improve things. But I, I don't think that I'm with Ruth. I fear that I think particularly after the crunch in living standards we're about to see, according to the OBR, over the next couple of years, I fear that the next election will be predominantly about the economy. Uh, the danger is that you might make populist gestures of knocking bits of the establishment. And uh, that was, after all, what the Conservatives did in their 2019 manifesto when they were threatening their sort of constitutional review, which was laying the groundwork for things like uh, an attack on judicial review and uh, whatever. So uh, I'm not sure you want it to be a part of an electoral strategy. What would be good would be if there is a bit of a sort of second order bidding war between the parties running up to the next election on who can do more to re-establish trust in politics and trust in our institutions. And then I think what we've seen is we have a lot of ad hoc institutions that are not on a statutory basis. Now, uh, Alison Young's producing a paper uh, for the IFG Review on entrenchment, um, which is very difficult in our system with parliamentary sovereignty. But if you put things into law, and then the judges decide that it's got some sort of constitutional status does sort of give you a bit more protection. It's a bit harder just to ignore. Uh, so I think it's um, so I think it'd be really interesting to see if we can do that. And it's actually in both parties' interest to do that because if people think that they're signing up to be part of a class that's widely reviled. Uh, so sort of puts off good candidates. One of the things we need are good people wanting to go into politics and being seen to want to do it for the right reasons. So I do think they both have quite a big vested interest in re-establishing faith in that. So I think a lot more of these ad hoc bodies and powers need to be properly put into legislation and put at proper, proper genuine arm's length. And maybe more of them have to become parliamentary bodies than ones that are appointed and report into government, which you know, is another layer of arm's lengthiness to give them a bit more distance from the government of the day, which is where you really need those sort of constitutional guardians. Mm. The point about electoral competition is is is, is really interesting. I, I think I'm 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 a bit less cynical than the Ruth and, and Jill, particularly given the strength of our polling, which just shows overwhelming support. For integrity, and you know, I don't think it's an accident that that was the first of the three things that uh, that uh, Sunak committed himself to on the steps of Number Ten. I also don't think it's an accident that, for example, we got this intervention from Starmer at the weekend about the House of Lords. Uh, Labour are trying to shame the the Sunak administration on Lords' appointments, and so he's got some decisions to make there. Um, Lisa, let's have the next round, and then I think that will be the last round. Okay, so we are going to go first of all to Gareth Williams, um, and then we have a couple of anonymous questions, which I'll read out. Okay. Hi, Gareth. Um, go ahead and ask a question. Oh, hi. Um, yes, it's really about Northern Ireland, but I, I, I'm more interested in Colm's view, but also in, in, in your other commentators. So um, it seems to me, at least, that um, Sunak probably, and Jeremy Hunt certainly, you know, want to deal with the EU. But any deal with the EU uh, on the protocol seems to me it's inconceivable that that will meet the DUP's tests. Um, 
so you know is there any solution to this i mean you know there's very little leverage it seems to me the uk government's got to force the dup into an executive but does anybody see any way out of this that's really the question <laughs> yeah that is one of his most difficult corners isn't it okay lisa um you're going to ask us the other two questions i am maybe similarly thorny um, a couple of people have uh, asked questions uh, about this morning's supreme court ruling uh, on scottish independence um and so I'll try to roll them together into the general question. You, what should Rishi Sunak and the UK government be thinking about as a result of this? Are there things um, that they should be thinking of doing, um, particularly in behavioural terms, but, but perhaps not only before the end of this parliament? Um, and finally, a question on process uh, from an anonymous um, questioner uh, who asks, is there scope for a UK wide national conversation on some of these constitutional issues? Some of the challenges outlined by the speakers are technical, but issues on issues like standards in public life, the nature of the relationship with devolved parliaments, the Bill of Rights Bill, the executive legislative relationship, could a national conversation provide some form of reality check? Excellent. Now, I can't remember what orders I've done with the speakers, but let me go to Colm first and then maybe Ruth and Jill. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, the, uh, Gareth's question about Northern Ireland um, is, is, I think, a very, very good one. It's not at all clear what position could accommodate some of the DUP's objections, in particular those relating to their view of sovereignty and the nature of the UK, uh, Northern Ireland's place within the wider UK. Um, it, it's, it's exceptionally difficult to identify any ground, a, any deal that the EU could sign off, could possibly sign off on, which would um, also be amenable to the DUP. And um, there's also a lurking background issue here. Let, let me be very frank about it. There's a certain degree of uncertainty um, as to whether the DUP is in any way eager to go into government again, especially with the prospect of a Sinn Féin first minister, which for obvious reasons are, is, you know, does raise the hackles on the DUP side of the political divide in Northern Ireland. Um, so in, in, there's, there's considerable uncertainty as to what concessions could be made to allow the DUP to um, come back in within devolved government in Northern Ireland. That, for me, raises the real possibility that we may not see devolved government in Northern Ireland in place for a very, very long time. I, 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 I certainly see that as the potential to becoming a, a long running um, constitutional conundrum um, that, that will require some very, very careful leadership to try and resolve. Um, on the point of the wider constitutional convention, which links into the debate that will inevitably be triggered by this morning's Supreme Court decision. Um, look, there are there are real points of disagreement between key actors as to their constitutional vision. You're not going to find a clear consensus between the SNP and Labour and Conservatives on the constitutional future of the UK. I do think that sort of a, a, a hardline, um, corrosive, norm-challenging approach, um, and which is an approach that has been adopted by quite a few ministers over the last five, six years, um, is widening fractures in the UK's constitution settlement, is, is storing up future trouble. And I think um, as a first step, whereas a constitutional convention may be desirable, if not necessarily practicable in the short term, as a first step, I think there needs to be serious thought given towards a more conciliatory approach to all of these issues, a greater emphasis on trying to establish consensus and a greater consensus, a greater uh, move towards bringing people in the room, trying to agree settled solutions, rather than um, maintaining a constant approach of, 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 of fracturing contestation and antagonism. There you go. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Ruth? Yeah, I mean, I, I, nothing to add on the Northern Ireland question. In terms of, um, in terms of the situation regarding Scotland in the aftermath of, uh, of today's decision, I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, I think, in terms of the approach that um, the Prime Minister wants, wants to take in terms of being more collegiate and more consultative and so on, and whether or not there is actually anything substantive below the surface, um, or whether it's uh, sort of a, an, an approach and an attitude of mind only. I mean, in, in terms of practical things, you know, how is the intergovernmental relation machine, relations machinery going to work in practice? You know, is he up for supporting greater interparliamentary relations to encourage, um, you know, engagement and, and, and consultation at the legislative level? Um, is he going to put his sort of support behind those kinds of measures? 
Um, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, the position of the Conservative Party and the position of the SNP are, are not aligned at all. And I think the question for him is, what, what, are the, what are the areas where the SNP arguments run about the relationship between Westminster and Edinburgh, between Whitehall and Edinburgh? What can he cut away at? To, to rob them of some of their arguments. Um, and obviously there are, there are, there are limits to that. Um, could a national conversation on some of these constitutional issues work? I mean, I think, I think I'm rather with Colm on this. I mean, until we get a, a, a sense of consensus on some of the key issues and a willingness to work on a cross-party basis, um, I'm not sure that, those, uh, that any kind of conversation like that is going to go um, terribly far. Thank you. Jill, the last word to you on these three very important questions. <laughs> well, I was slightly hoping we won't run out of time. No, um, I think on Northern Ireland it's very, very difficult because, you know, finding finding that sweet spot, you know, splitting the difference. We've, we've at UK and Changing Europe suggested maybe we should try and do some sort of third party process, one more like we use in the uh, some of the stage of the Good Friday Agreement in the aftermath of bringing in a third party arbitrator, make the process more transparent, uh, making sure Jonathan Stevens has written for us on this former permanent sector of the Northern Ireland office to make sure that there's more engagement of the parties, because, you know, rather than regard solving the protocol over here as the wholly owned uh, project of the British government and the EU government with sort of minimal input from the parties in Northern Ireland into that and behind closed doors to just actually spell out what really is this about, what really is is practical and uh, do the choices there. I think one of the things that the DUP's sort of weaponization of the protocol uh, in terms of agreement or otherwise to serve an executive is doing is reopening conversations about whether the Good Friday Agreement institutions are still functioning properly and whether you know power sharing should move to voluntary rather than mandatory so that the UUP who actually are running on a line that uh, you shouldn't be holding government uh, in Northern Ireland in hock um, because there are, do you, because the, the protocol you know would have a chance to nominate a first minister from the unionist community or whatever. So I think it's really interesting that conversation. I don't think we're ready for that yet. But I think it's really interesting as we approach the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement to say whether Northern Ireland really can have a system which is so prone to repeat collapses when one side or the other decides with Jordan, there's some really interesting consequences as well for the potential emergence of proper opposition and scrutiny in Northern Ireland, none of which really we're talking about accountability here, but accountability in Northern Ireland is um, a very non-existent beast, I think it's fair to say, and how we actually run devolved governments. So I think it's a separate set of governments. On Scotland, I think just two quick things to add into the hopper. Um, one is, I think Rishi Sunak himself is a much less divisive figure with Scotland than either Boris Johnson or Liz Truss was. Uh, he still has quite a positive, you know, he was the most positively regarded uh, figure because of the sort of furlough hangover. So Leicester's advice there, can he leverage that and his reasonableness and sort of sweetness to reduce the ability of the SNP to turn absolutely everything into a grievance against Westminster? Maybe focus a bit back on the SNP's performance in governing, governing Scotland. And I do think the other bit of change context is the potential prospect for a Labour government or a Labour-led government in Westminster, because one of the big sources of SNP grievance is, of course, you know, however Scotland votes, we always end up with a Conservative government elected by the English foisted on us, and we don't want that. So I think that's a sort of interesting, it's very interesting for Nicola Sturgeon's next move, of course, which is to teach the, is to, you know, use the general election as a quasi referendum on independence in Scotland, whether the Scots agree to have their votes used in that way and what where that ends up. Because I think quite a lot of people think that there's a potential for a better performance by Labour in Scotland at the next election. It set its bar pretty low, so it doesn't have to do that well to deliver on that. But I think that's a sort of interestingly different bit of context. But I think we should see that we'll probably put a bit more effort into trying to make devolution work. Michael Gove, of course, has taken that back as well. And I think, you know, in the constitutional terms, and I think he also presided over the you know, announcement, the IGR review and things like that. So I think there's a bit more, a bit more UK government uh, muscle behind trying to make the current, uh, current settlement 
work at least in a sort of more courteous and professional way and a less sort of bombastic and confrontational way. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, well, look, you have been an absolutely terrific panel of speakers. Uh, I think that's been a great event. Uh, many thanks to the audience uh, for attending and for your questions, but huge thanks to the speakers. I'm thinking there would be arguments in favour of getting this panel or perhaps even a different panel together in a year's time or something to kind of look at the scorecard. So how did he do? And in thinking about the scorecard, I realise I failed to plug, Jill, your excellent blog on the UK and Changing Europe blog, um, asking about how he can um, how he can implement this pledge um, on integrity, professionalism and accountability. And also our own blog uh, on the Constitution Unit blog asking the same question. So if you want to look at what some of the scorecard issues are, please look at those two posts. Um, thank you all. Um, as I said at the beginning of the session, uh, there will be a video of this event on our website and YouTube channel soon, and there will also be the audio file uh, going out as a Constitution Unit podcast. So those in the audience will receive an email when those files are available. And if you've enjoyed this event, then I would strongly encourage you to share uh, the links with your family, colleagues and friends. Um, and if you're not already signed up to the Constitution Unit's events mailing list, please do sign up in order to be the first to hear about our forthcoming events. You just need to go to our website, click Get Involved, and then subscribe in order to put yourself on the mailing list. But I can give you advance preview now that our next event is going to be on the 8th of December on the question of the executive's prerogative powers. And this in part marks publication of a new book on the subject by former Constitution Unit Director Robert Hazel. Uh, the, de the details are not yet on our website, but they will be there and on Twitter shortly. So until then, or wherever we meet again, uh, thank you all so much um, and goodbye.